Hi, this is Jonathan, and welcome to session one of Project Connect. In this session, we are going to present an overview of the model of social connection that will guide this entire course. Before we start with presenting the overview of the model, we would like to simply give you a little bit of the history. We've spent about a decade developing this model. It's been a lot of work, and over this time period, we have read hundreds of scientific studies to make sure the model really represents what we know works, and we've even conducted several of these studies ourselves. And it's important, as we said in the introduction, that we would not present anything to you that doesn't make sense to us as human beings, that doesn't make sense to us personally. This is, after all, a model of social connection, a model of intimacy. And our experience is that this is really hard. It's hard to form really intimate relationships and to take the risks required and to engage in the vulnerability required to do this well. So it's really important that we do not just talk about the research, but that we really connect this to our personal experiences as well. And we also are clinical psychologists, and the work we are presenting to you has been informed by working with dozens of our psychotherapy clients over the years on how to help them improve their relationships. So that's really the background of it. Now, as we get into the model, I like to lead with this picture. This is actually a picture of my daughter there on the right. And you can see in the distance in the fog, her mother, my wife on the left, and my daughter's running to her in the fog. And I like this image because it suggests that there's something about this work that is hard and scary. You have to take risks. It's like running through the fog. But it's not so scary that the end isn't in sight. The destination is there. My daughter's mother is waiting with her outstretched arms and encouraging her and helping her along. And that's kind of the tone we want to achieve with this work. The work is hard, but we're also here to support you. We want you to step outside your comfort zone, but not so far that you're lost in the fog. So overall, our aim is to help you create and maintain close relationships. That's really the goal of this work. And we know from science and life that being able to create and maintain close relationships is essential to mental and physical health, to happiness, to meaning in life, and actually predicts longevity, how long you live. We really believe this work is important. We want to help you with stuff that's important. Now, as we talk about relationships, it's important to emphasize that you, the participant, have choice. You may or may not be in a romantic relationship. You may or may not want to work on that. That's your choice. Do you want to work on relationships with family members? You know, it's often the case that with family members, our mothers, our fathers, or other caregivers, they're the ones who got us into this mess in the first place. They're the ones who raised us in ways that have given us difficulties. And so they're often the hardest people to do this with. What about friends or work colleagues or schoolmates? The point is, whoever is right for you, your choice, who you want to improve a relationship with or relationships with, that's who we're going to encourage you to work on. Okay, so that's a little background material. Now, on to the model. This is your first exposure to the model. You'll be seeing this picture over and over again over the course of this course. And right now, it's a lot of words and it's pretty busy, but I guarantee you it's going to start to make sense. And by the end of this course, you'll really not just understand the words in this picture, but how to apply this in your life. So we're going to walk you through it. First, this is what you will learn and practice over the course of this work. This model contains what we call our core relationship skills, or sometimes we just call them cores. Each of the terms in this model represents one core. So there's a bunch of them on this page. And the cores come together to describe four key moments of connection. And these moments of connection happen when two people are interacting. So overall, these skills describe 
how you can engage in an interaction with another person to create moments of connection that matter, that help you improve the relationship. So we're going to walk through this nice and slowly. Overall, there are these terms awareness, courage, and love. These are like the guiding principles of the model. Overall, to the extent we can engage in our interactions with awareness, with courage, and with love, the interaction is going to go better. So what do we mean by that? The idea is that each moment of an interaction starts with awareness and involves one person engaging in courage and the other responding with love. So there's this basic equation in which somebody does something courageous and then the other person responds well, responds lovingly. lovingly. Now, in real interactions, it can be really messy. We've tried to simplify it as like a linear sequence for this model, but we recognize that real interactions are messy. And that's okay. It's great that real life is messy, but our model is simple. It's like learning to dance, partner dance. At first, you just work on step by step by step, but then the dance is where you put it all together in a natural and fluid and beautiful way. So, when we get to courage, you're going to learn four core courage skills. First, the skill of showing yourself, then expressing yourself, and then asking for things. And then the final courage skill is called accepting and connecting. So this will all make sense to you as we go. On the other side, there are three core love skills. The first is providing safety. The second we call validating. And the third is giving. So together, these four courage skills and three love skills form four moments of connection or relations between courage and love. The first relation and the most important one is when the courageous person engages in showing yourself and the person on the love side provides safety. So we're going to walk you through that moment of connection a lot in this course. It's really important. The second moment of connection is when the courageous person engages in expressing yourself and the person on the love side responds with validation or is validating. The third moment of connection is when the courageous person asks for something and the person on the love side gives the person what they asked for. The fourth moment of connection is the most complicated one to describe in this model. We'll walk you through it now, but then slow it down a few times over this course, and it'll all make sense to you by the end. This fourth moment of connection starts with the response of the loving person. Right? So the courageous person has done something, and then the loving person responds with, as we just described, with providing safety, validating, and giving. So now the question is, how does the courageous person respond to the loving person's response? And that's this fourth moment of connection. The courageous person engages in what we're calling accepting and connecting in response to the loving person's response. And you'll notice there's this arrow from accepting and connecting back up into the heart of the courageous person because it turns out accepting and connecting is in fact a really courageous thing to do. It's hard for most of us. So those are the four moments of connection. Now, as I said before, Every moment of connection starts with awareness, and so we're going to teach you some awareness skills as well. And you notice that these two people in our model are sitting on this teeter-totter on a foundation of balance and reciprocity. And we're going to talk to you about what we mean by balance and reciprocity, but I'm guessing you're already having some thoughts about what that means as well. Now I'm going to spend a few minutes walking through each of these four moments of connection in a little more detail.
but this is all just an introduction. We're going to spend a lot of time on each of these in later moments of the course and then giving you homework assignments to practice it yourself. But for now, just a few minutes on this first relation of showing yourself and providing safety. First, some definitions. Showing yourself can be defined as letting someone see what you are feeling and who you really are. So what's most important here is if you're feeling something, can you show what you're feeling to the other person? A lot of showing yourself and showing your feelings actually takes the form of gentle, natural eye contact. Are you really connecting with this other person so they can see you through your eyes? I'll have an exercise on eye contact next week. A lot of showing yourself also has to do not just with what you are saying, but with how you are saying it. In other words, your voice tone. Does the tone of your voice match your feelings so they can understand you from how you're saying things? When we talk about showing yourself and talk about showing your feelings, we're not talking about wild, out of control displays of feeling. We're talking about showing feelings, but in a regulated way. Sometimes we're super upset and we can become what psychologists call dysregulated or out of control in our feelings. That happens in relationships and the partner in that situation needs to respond well and needs to be somebody who you really trust to respond well. But for the most part in this model, we're talking about the regulated expression of feelings. Finally, another word we can use to describe this showing yourself relation is being authentic. Just really letting yourself be who you are. And the final word is being vulnerable. Okay, now on the love side, the definition is creating a safe space for the courageous person to engage in emotional expression. Often in relationships, we don't spend enough time talking about this really foundational need for safety. The first thing we need more than anything else is to be safe so we can be ourselves. So we're going to talk about that in this course and make sure we don't jump over this really foundational relation between showing yourself and providing safety. Providing safety can be as simple as just indicating to the other person that you're paying attention. Again, a lot of this can be eye contact. Eye contact is so important to the work we're doing. But there's other ways to show that you're paying attention as well. And when you're paying attention and just engaged in a natural interaction in this way, your emotions, the person on the love side's emotions, naturally sync up with what the courageous person is expressing. There's this synchrony between the two, and that actually feels really safe for both people. There's sort of safety in the shared synchrony. We'll talk about that. Touch can really help a courageous person when they're really vulnerable. Of course, it must be appropriate. It must be invited. It must make sense in the context of the interaction and meet that courageous person's needs. When it's appropriate, it's really important. A hug or just a firm grip on the person's shoulder or arm to really let them know that you're there with them. Verbal expressions of safety are also really helpful at times. It could be as simple as simply letting the person know that they're safe with you. And finally, similar to this idea of synchrony, this idea of reciprocity, often one of the best ways to let a courageous person know that they're safe is to join them in the vulnerability. The next word I want to suggest is acceptance. Letting the other person, the courageous person, know that you accept them and you accept their feelings. And the final word here is caring, expressing to the other person that you care. The second moment of connection or relation 
is between expressing yourself and validating. So the definition of expressing yourself is talking about your feelings and who you really are. Now, this can be almost anything. Talking about your life events and experiences, both positive life events and negative life events. In some ways, this is really the bedrock of relationships. This is what we do every day with our partners, with our friends, with our family members, even with coworkers. We're just talking about what happened in our days. And letting somebody get to know you in this way is really fundamental. Talking about more difficult things in our past, our histories, autobiographical memories are just essential to expressing yourself and developing intimacy. As well as just the daily stuff, hassles, things you're feeling and thinking in the moment. Just letting somebody see who you are by sharing and talking about this stuff. Essentially, whatever we're thinking and feeling in the moment, can we express it? Finally, our values, goals, aspirations, identity, expressing ourselves in these more important ways. So on the one hand, it can be simply coming home from a hard day and venting to your partner about how hard the day is. That's expressing yourself. But so is calling up an old family member and talking to them about a really important aspect of your identity, letting the person know who you really are. When people express themselves in these ways, the fundamental need is for them to feel validated. And so the loving person's task is to respond to all of this in a validating way, defined as giving validation, understanding, and empathy. So understanding is probably the best word to use to really describe this. When somebody is expressing themselves, do you understand and can you convey to the other person that you understand. You can see how this relates to providing safety and acceptance as well. One of the skills of providing validating responses is not just saying you understand everything, but paying particular attention to the other person's feelings and to what really matters with respect to their identity. We'll be talking about this a lot in this course. Okay. The third relation is the relation between the courageous person asking for something and the loving person giving what he or she asked for, or they asked for. So asking for what you need can look like all sorts of things. There's lots of things you can ask for in relationships. So first, simply asking the other person questions to get to know them. This can actually be difficult for a lot of people, especially people who are shy or socially anxious. Simply asking the other person questions is really important to get to know them. Where are you from? Do you like dancing? Or whatever it may be. Getting better at asking those questions. Asking for closeness. This is like the cliched thing that happens in relationships. Would you like to have coffee with me? Would you like to have dinner with me? Would you like to get married? Without being able to ask for these things, it's really hard to see how relationships move forward. Asking for support when you need it. I'm upset about whatever it is I may be upset about. Can I share this with you? Will you listen to me? Being able to talk to somebody when we're upset is super important, and asking for that is required. Other wants and needs in relationships. Let's go out to dinner. Well... Can we see a movie instead? I've already had dinner. Being able to express your wants and needs in that way. Asking for self-care. Sometimes what you have to ask for in relationships is not so much about the relationship, but it's negotiating self-care in a relationship. So I'm sorry, I can't go out to dinner. I can't see a movie. I need to get work done. I need to spend time with myself for whatever reason. We'll call that asking. Asking for advice. I'm stuck, can you help? 
asking for other forms of help or favors? Can I have a ride home or can you help me move? Saying no in our model is actually a form of asking. You may be a little confused by that, but when we get to talking about this in detail, we'll walk you through it. Um, no, I don't want that. It requires you stating your need, and then it requires the loving person to give you what you asked for. Finally, we'll talk about asking for apologies. I don't have an example of that for you. And then asking for forgiveness. Really, really hard things to ask for in relationships and really hard things to give as well. Now, on the giving side, what's most important here is really giving the person what they asked for and not what they didn't ask for and not not giving at all. And so some of the big issues that show up here as we teach people how to give well is sometimes people give too much, sometimes people give too little. And we'll walk you through that as we get to that part of the course. So those were the three primary relations. I told you this fourth relation is the hard one. It's kind of hard to describe. It starts with the loving person providing any kind of loving response. And then the courageous person now is in a position to respond to that response. And we're going to call this response to the response accepting and connecting. And we put an arrow from accepting and connecting back into the heart of the courageous person because it turns out accepting and connecting is a really vulnerable, courageous thing to do. It really maps on to showing and expressing yourself. So in this way, the model becomes cyclical. It keeps going. So definition of accepting connecting is accepting another's response to you and expressing appreciation and closeness in response. This idea of accepting the other person's love, accepting the other person's response, is really important. Allowing yourself to accept and take in your partner's response. It turns out to be a really vulnerable and hard thing to do. There's all sorts of reasons why we block this and minimize it and so forth. So we're going to talk about expressing appreciation and closeness in a couple ways. First is appreciation and gratitude. This can be as simple as saying, thank you, I appreciate it, but of course there's lots of ways we can express appreciation and gratitude. It's really important to let the loving person know that you appreciate and accept their response. And this is where it starts. Second, expressing closeness and connection with the other person. After they've given you a loving response, you can say, I feel closer to you. And of course, the most obvious and prototypical way of expressing this is to say, I love you to somebody. And then finally, really important for accepting and connecting is this idea of expressing reciprocity. When somebody has done something loving for you, can you express that you can reciprocate? I am here for you too. I am here to provide loving responses for you too, and all the ways we express that. Now, on the loving side, your task now is once again to respond to all of this accepting and connecting. And it's helpful to recognize that this moment for the courageous person is one of the key moments of vulnerability in a relationship when they're expressing their feelings for you, allowing themselves to accept your response. And so we're going to define your response as accepting the vulnerability in this and providing safety and all the other loving responses. So some of the things we mentioned before, I'll just highlight quickly here. Showing synced emotions that you're with the other person, demonstrating acceptance, and of course verbal expressions and expressions of caring. And finally, this idea of reciprocity. And of course, the easiest thing to use to describe this is when somebody says, I love you, to say, I love you too.
The last piece of the model to describe is the awareness piece. As I said at the beginning, every moment of connection starts with awareness. And we can think of awareness from the perspective of the courageous person, and we can think of awareness from the perspective of the loving person. And it turns out the kinds of awareness that are needed are the same, but the way it plays out is a little different. So for the courageous person, what's most important is self-awareness. This has to do with awareness of what's going on in your body, what you're feeling. You can't show and express your feelings if you're not aware of it very well. Awareness of your wants and needs, so you can ask for what you need. Awareness of key aspects of your identity, so you know who you are and what you want in a relationship as the interaction is happening. Awareness of your values. One way to look at awareness is to think about my best self. Who do I really want to be in this relationship? And am I aware of that version of my best self in the moment of the interaction so I can really act from that position? Now, awareness also includes awareness of the other person. We sort of toggle back and forth between self and other awareness. Other awareness is actually very similar to self-awareness, but just with respect to the other person. So what's the other person feeling? What's the other person needing? And how is this other person responding to me? How am I impacting them? The final piece of awareness is context awareness. Not just awareness of yourself and the other, but awareness of the context in which your interaction is happening. This context includes the nature of the relationship. Is this a romantic relationship? Is this just a friendship relationship? Making sure you get that right. And awareness of the surroundings. Okay, now, from the perspective of the other person, as I said before, the balance of self and other awareness is different. For the other person, the primary focus is on other awareness. In other words, the loving person's primary awareness is of the courageous person. What is this person feeling and needing? One way to look at this is to use the term empathic accuracy. Am I having accurate empathy for the feelings of the courageous person? That empathic accuracy can really help me respond well. Am I able to take their perspective and understand what they're feeling and thinking? Self-awareness is also important for the loving person. It's really the same stuff. Awareness of my body, my feelings, my wants, my needs, key aspects of identity, values, my best self, and awareness of the context is also important. The nature of the relationship and the surroundings. The final two terms of the model are balance and reciprocity. In other words, the courageous and loving people as they're interacting are on this foundation of balance and reciprocity. Balance means that courageous behavior should be balanced with love and love should be balanced with courage. So think about it. If you are in the courageous position of asking for something, can you ask in a way that is still loving and compassionate and considerate of the other person? Or are you asking in just a really aggressive, hostile way that has no love in it at all? We want courage to be balanced with love to keep that relationship moving really effectively. And balance in the other direction is also important. In other words, love is often courageous. Sometimes the most loving thing to do is to take a risk, be vulnerable yourself with that person. So getting the balance right is super important. The last term is reciprocity. It's similar to balance, except that with reciprocity, we're thinking about courage and love being reciprocal over time between the two people. So relationships are best when both people engage in and reciprocate each other's courage and love over time. Some relationships, one person is always the one asking, the other person is always the one giving, one person is the one who's usually showing and expressing themselves. The other person is usually the one listening. Those relationships are not reciprocal. Over time, we want both people to be showing themselves, expressing themselves, asking for what they need, and both people to be providing safety, providing validation, and giving what they need in order for the relationships to work.
Okay, so that's the whole model. We are going to slow down over the course of this course and walk you through it piece by piece, but hopefully this has been a useful introduction. Next, we are going to talk to you about homework. The idea is that in this course, each week we will introduce a different aspect of the model, a different core skill. And each week we will start to help you practice awareness in order to really work the whole model. And we'll do that by giving you a meditation and asking you to practice it. And then we will encourage you each week to try the skills that we're teaching you with specific practices with others you choose. 